Guys, welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Before we get going on this episode, I want to thank the sponsors of the podcast. I want to thank GoHunt.com, Cody Nelson, my friend of 20 plus years. I call him the glassing guru, the optics authority. He's the optics manager at GoHunt.com. If you guys have any optics needs at all, whether it be binoculars, spotting scopes, rifle scopes, tripods, anything to do with glassing, give the glassing guru a call. You can reach Cody at 702-847-8747. That's extension 2. You can email him at optics at gohunt.com or you can text him directly on his cell phone at 602-399-3699. Ask him any question either by text or by call. I want to thank Cody for all the work that he does with the J. Scott Outdoors podcast listeners. I also want to remind you guys it's application season. There's not a better hunting resource than the Go Hunt Insider. Uh, For a free trial, you can go to gohunt.com forward slash jscott. You can also get a $50 Go Hunt Gear Shop gift card when signing up. I want to thank kuyu.com, kuyu ultralight hunting. Kuyu is the ultralight hunting gear that I've been wearing since 2010. Uh, go to KUIU.com and you can order directly. It's a direct to consumer uh, brand and they have phenomenal gear there at KUIU.com. I uh, also want to thank Phonescope.com. Use the JSCOT21 promo code to get 10% off on all orders. Also, Apex Ammunition. During turkey season, uh, the podcast gets sponsored by Apex Ammunition. Go to Apex Munition. Dot com. It's the home of the TSS, the Tungsten Super Shot. Uh, it's the best turkey uh, loads on the market. Go to apexmunition.com. Uh, guys, thanks for listening to the podcast. I also want to let you guys know that are listening for uh, Colorado um, information. I actually have a few elk and mule deer uh, tags available in Colorado on private land if you guys have an interest also doing an elk bear um, archery combo uh, reach out to me at j scott outdoors uh, on instagram uh, or j scott outdoors at gmail.com reach out and uh, for more information i'll be happy to share it with you let's get right to this episode Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today we have Chris Rowe of Rowe Hunting Resources, and we're going to be talking about setup tactics for spring turkey hunting. And Chris and I have already covered pretty extensively uh, scouting and roosting birds and all the different situations that play into roosting birds and how to roost birds and where to find them and what have you. Today we're going to be talking about setups. Chris, how you doing, buddy? Doing all right, my friend. How are you been? Good. I'm excited today to talk about uh, turkey hunting and talking about these setups. And when I think of setups, I think of kind of three scenarios. I think of the early morning roost, that situation where you've made a plan from the night before and you are going to, you know, probably make an hour's worth of a setup and then you've got kind of your mid-morning, you know, say like your 8 o'clock, if I were to pick a time like, you know, 8 o'clock to 10 o'clock kind of mid-morning run and gun, midday run and gun, and then, and, and you know, midday could also be set, so, you know, just a nice good spot to be setting and maybe a strut zone or a meadow <clears throat> or something like that. And then I've got, you know, late afternoon into evening, which then, you know, filters its way into, yeah, late afternoon, late evening or evening setups. And then the whole process starts over again as you progress into that evening setup. You're now roosting birds, trying to roost birds for the next morning and you start it all over again. So, going to be fun here to talk with you about this uh you ready to roll oh yeah no i think that's a good i think that's a good separation that's kind of how i want things too so no i think that makes sense okay so let's um dive into the early morning roost situation and i want to talk about a few things uh first uh, go over our outline here and like we've talked before in a couple of these other episodes is, in my opinion, even if you know exactly where you're going, 
for that early morning roost situation, I always want to be early because I can always take a nap during midday and people that know me know that I do take a, <laughs> a, a power nap during midday. I just, it's huge, but I get up super early and I like to be there in my roost setup super early. And I do that for several reasons. One is if for some reason I get to my spot and on the way there, if, if I'm not, you know, out camping and walking from my camp, if I'm traveling in a vehicle and I have vehicle breakdown or I have a flat tire or something like that, if I'm way early, I can handle a lot of situations. Or I get to my spot and there's a truck parked exactly where I want to go. Or I've had it before where guys roll in the night before at, you know, 10 or 30 at night when I'm already asleep and they picked right where I was going to park my truck to camp. <laughs> yeah. So you have to be able to adjust. And I think if you don't get up, you know, usually my alarm goes off at three o'clock and I'm usually always on the move by three thirty, um, no later than three thirty. Uh, and obviously, as the season progresses, it gets light earlier. So when I get into May and I'm down there hunting ghouls, a lot of times I'm getting up way, way early because, you know, it's there, you know, for us in Arizona and what I found, you know, in the southwestern states, about 430. I don't know what it is about 430, but 430 is when birds start gobbling. And so I need to be in position way prior to 4.30 because I need to get into my spot, get set down, get all settled in, and then let the morning unfold. So 3 o'clock is usually always the wake-up time. As I get closer into May, I usually wake up at 2.50, and then I'm trying to be out the door at, at 3.15, you know, out of my camp. At, you know, rolling to my spot. Now, obviously, if I have an hour drive to it where I have a bird roosted, sometimes I got to get up earlier. Um, well, and the other thing, too, is like we talked about in, uh, I, believe, I think, we, well, we did talk about it in a previous episode, uh, moonlight. I mean, in moonlight, if you've got a full moon or a bright moon in the early morning, especially at just after a full moon, those early morning hours, that moon is still up, and it's bright. Yeah. And, and and I'll even say that the moon is bright, and a lot of times on those situations, if you get up early enough, you can actually walk in in a full moon, you know, or, or yep. a bright moon, yep. get settled in, but then the moon tends to drop below the horizon, and there's usually always like a 30 or 40 minute gap there where it gets kind of dark again, sure. and then all of a sudden it gets light. Well, you've, you've used the, the moon, you know, we're talking sometimes, you know, 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning when I'm actually walking in because I'm able to walk right to where I need to be. Most of the time, they're not going to be awake and not going to see you when it's that early. But you can see plain as day. You get set up and maybe even, you you know, you tilt your head against the tree and, you know, you, you, you might fall asleep for 30 minutes again. I've done that where I walk in with the moonlight. Then you get that 30 minutes of kind of dark phase. And all of a sudden, a bird gobbles and wakes me up, and a, you yep. know I'm probably over there snoring too. Yeah, and, I, and I've taken you know doing some of the stuff I do out here in Kansas with you know youth hunts and and taking folks hunting. There's been times where you know maybe their hunt is a Friday, a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, three day deal. They come in Thursday evening. We've literally they've rolled in at say eight or nine o'clock or ten o'clock at night, you know, or you know they left work on Thursday. And they get out here, and it's it's eleven o'clock at night, and they're beat tired. And I'm like, okay, you guys ready to go in the morning? Yeah. Do you want to go help me set a blind? They're like, what? I'm like, I'm headed out the door now. It's eleven p.m. because the moon just came up, and I can see. I'm going to use that moonlight. We're we're going to go out, set the blind, set get decoys. You know, whether we get decoys set or staged, doesn't matter. But I'm going to use that moonlight to get out there in the in the middle of the night when those birds are just rock steady asleep. And then I can back out and we can just, we can, you know, hit the ground running in the morning. But yeah, take advantage of the moonlight. But I think like we said before, 
just be careful because if you're out there in the morning and you're farting around too close to the roost and that moonlight is is or the moon is up, they can still see you. Yeah, and I want to I want to mention something too, and I haven't actually done this, but I believe that you could with a very bright light. I believe that in the middle of the night, 12 midnight, 2 o'clock in the morning, you know, just dead asleep, I'm pretty sure that you could, with a flashlight, walk your way with your flashlight, your bright, let's say, you know, super high lumens, you know, bright, bright light, walk and go right up and right under a roost tree and then shine the light up on the bird. And my bet is there's a good chance they might not even lift their head out from under their wing. I have never tried it. I've never done it. But I'm betting you could do that. I think you might be able to get away with it if you're quiet. If you're quiet, right. So, I would. Yeah. I, I would say, I don't know. If, I, I, may be test, I might test that out on one of my personal hunts. I don't know if I'd test that out with a client, but... Well, I'm just trying to make the point that at the right time, yes. you could probably drive right up to a bird that's roosted and get out, and they still are going to be roosted right above you. Of course, they're probably going to wake up then, but turkeys will allow you to get right underneath them as long as you do it. You could do it in the dark, and you could, and I have, yep. not on purpose, but I've actually snuck into the roosts before, or a roost setup. And literally had hens in the tree that I have my back to. And I've been able to creep in there, not knowing the hens are in the tree, but the gobblers, you know, 40, 50 yards, 60 yards. And yeah, all of a sudden it's getting gray and I've been dead still and everything settled down. They finally woke up. Well, they're woke up and they're in my, I'm, I'm right below them. Yeah. They're, 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 they're yelping and doing their tree calls in my tree that I'm leaning up against. Yeah, the big thing is, is so, if you didn't wake them up, and I, and I think that's key because we did talk about earlier. You know, if you if you do too much stuff around the roost, or if you if you bump them on the roost and they see you and they know that you're there, you yeah. can. You, they, I mean, a lot of times, especially in the mornings, they'll pitch out. I mean, they might gobble, they might carry on and do whatever they want, but they'll pitch out and go the other way. I think what right. you're talking about here, and I agree, and I utilize it myself, is I will use the moonlight, but I am super stealthy, quiet. You know, I I picked up a couple new uh, Primos double bowl blinds this year, and unfortunately, I mean, it's still the, the double wide blind. I still think it's the, by far the best blind ever made, but unfortunately, they've made some changes that uh, they've used some different materials, and those materials, I'm sorry, are loud. And I'm like, dang it, because now I, I know right off the bat, I will not be able to use uh, those two particular, those brand new ones, those two particular blinds, I will not be able to use those under a roost on a, on a you know, basically where I'm going to slip in, set the blind up, and then hunt. It's just no way. There's, it's, they're going to be too loud setting up, and the birds are going to wake up. Whereas my other ones, oh, yeah, those babies are so broken in and so soft and so quiet that I can just whoop, slip right in there and they'll never have an inkling in the world. And then of course if you're just sitting against the tree like you're talking about with your butt against the tree, oh yeah, no. They'd never know. Yeah, I um you know, it <clears throat> you definitely want to get close in the morning, but you definitely want you if if a bird hears you, whether it be a hen or a gobbler, the gig's up. Mm -hmm. They may not blow out of the tree in the dark and most likely they won't. They will stay tight. And in essence, I've ne never done it. Obviously, I don't advocate it. But I think it could be done where you could walk in if you knew where the bird was roosted. I think you could literally, in the dark, walk in and shine the light up in a tree. And I think you could blast a turkey right out of the tree if, if you knew exactly where they were. Obviously, we would never do that. We don't advocate that. But they will stay put in that tree if it's dark. Yes, I think... There would be a time when they will blow out and fly away in the dark, but I think they're probably likely to, to hold tight and not blow out. But as soon as it gets halfway, you know, gray light, they could just blow out and fly the other way. Yeah. 
I guess my point in saying that is their defense mechanism is being in that tree. So they're not going to fly out in the dark and you hear people say, well, I hope they're in the same tree. Well, 99.9% yeah. of the time, the birds are where you left them. So if you roosted them the night before, unless a bobcat has crawled up in that tree with them and blown them out, yeah. and even if they did blow them out, I would argue that the turkeys are not roosted very far away in another tree because they don't fly around at night. They don't have night vision that you know they can fly around, and, and it's just their safety mechanism is in the tree. Well, and I, I know I have blown birds out um, in the dark, Getting, getting too close to them, but most of the time, those birds were already awake. So, right. in in my opinion, basically, they were up there, half asleep, half awake, whatever, and they heard me coming. They heard me get too close, and they and they had time to go. Uh, I don't feel right. I'm out. And most of that has been sound and me being way, way too close to them. Again, when we're talking about on a mountainside, I mean, I might be rocking a ridge and they're roosted. Well, the tree they're roosted in, the base of that tree might be, you know, 80 yards down the hill or 60 yards down the hill. But the treetops, the, they're 10 yards. They, that, yeah, it's, they're not that far away. And so all of a sudden I popped up and I walked over and boom, they're like, oh, my God, it's right there. And boom, they react. But they're going to. Yeah. So I guess we're we're rambling. But. I use the darkness all the time, and I will use whatever limited ambient light at night all the time to get myself in position. And yes, you want to be as close as you can possibly get most of the time for those morning sets. Yeah, and so in the morning, no lights, be quiet, be patient. I say get within 100 yards or closer of the roosted bird if you can. Let the birds call first. Let them get to goblin. First, what usually happens, what I've witnessed, is early, 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 the first thing you hear might be just a gobble, a random gobble at like 4.30 in the morning. And then you might not hear anything for a while, and then you'll hear, just real soft, you know, tree yelping and tree talk. And then as things progress, then all of a sudden as it's getting gray light, then you'll get birds to gobble. But um, do you have birds just random, boom, a bird gobbles, and then maybe you don't hear them for another 30 minutes, and then you hear hens, and then all of a sudden he chimes back in? Do you get that every once in a while? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Spe yeah. Especially, especially if you have a bright moon. Yeah. Yep. He'll be up. He'll be awake. He'll you know, just be sitting there milling around, and I guarantee there's probably other birds in there awake too. But yep. I've been absolutely been out there, you know, like you said, 4.30, 4 o'clock in the morning. I was like, go, go, go. You're like, what in the world are you doing? Go back to sleep. Yeah, and I, I mean, I have pulled up in areas before where, like, I may pull up to my spot at 3.30, and I'm getting my decoys and getting everything out of my truck, and I'm, you know, I'm getting ready to go walk down the ridge where I've planned, okay, I want to be in position at, say, 4 o'clock, and as I'm walking... All of a sudden, and I'm thinking, what in the world? What are you doing? <laughs> How am I going to sneak in there now yeah. when you guys are awake? And then if if you if you're hearing that, you might have to make a different plan because now your birds are awake. Yeah, at least at least he is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I always say, in my opinion, I don't want to call to the birds on the limb too early. I would rather let the bird gobble. I would rather let the hens start talking. And what I'm doing is I'm evaluating what situation do I have. Because what I love to hear is I love to hear a bird gobble. And then I wait and I hear a bird gobble again. And I listen. Gobbles again. And I'm listening, and what am I listening for? I'm listening to see if the ladies are there. And I'm listening, no hens, 
and he's gobbling, and the more that I don't hear hens, and the more he's gobbling, the more I'm excited, because I know that my chance of calling that bird to me when he doesn't have any hens, I know my chances, in my opinion, are going way up. So I think what I've seen other people do and what I've done in years past and making a mistake is calling too soon before I've made my evaluation of what is going on and what kind of situation and how many birds am I dealing with. Your thoughts. I am guilty as charged. I like to. I, I am. I'm, I'm guilty. I like to call way too much. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I, to be honest, for me, um, I think you know. A previous episode, we talked about the different types of birds that we're working. You know, if if I roosted him the night before, if I if I scouted him out, and I know that the bird, you know, he only gobbles once or twice, and and I think he's a mature bird and he's got hens. Okay, I know that going into the situation. Versus if I've, you know, set up on those, those two year olds that are just rocking. Okay. I, I kind of know that going into the situation. For me, I guess I evaluate when I start calling. Not so much based on what the birds are doing in the tree, but what I need them to do or what I need them to believe while they're up on the roost. And, and I, and I say, and I mean it by this. There are some instances where, whether I, it, because I scouted out properly and I knew exactly what trees those birds were in, and the, whether it's the, the limb, you know, the, maybe the pine limbs, the, the limbs themselves are thick enough to where it allows me to sneak in right in and get real, really close without them really seeing me, or it's pitch black and I can get in there without them seeing me, R- regardless, whatever, I can get close and more importantly, I can get close to where they want to pitch out and or pitch out and then I'm in their path on where they naturally want to go versus I think I know where the birds are. I don't know where they want to pitch out. I don't know where they want to go. All I can do is get close and then hope that I can get them to come my way. Those two situations for me are different in the fact that if I know where the birds are roosted and I know that I am either, say, on the same little finger ridge that they are and I'm upslope of them, or I am maybe even across from that the finger ridge that they're on, but I'm, I'm, in a, I'm near a spot where they can pitch out and sail and I know that they naturally want to come my way. If they want to pitch out in front of me or come my way on their own, absolutely, I'll just keep my mouth shut. And literally, I won't say a peep until maybe those hens really start talking and it maybe sounds like maybe they're getting ready to pitch out. And I'll use the wing and I can fly down or scratch around and I'll make it sound like, hey, I'm the first bird that touched the ground and I'm already where you want to be, so just come. So I don't have to call that much. Versus... If I'm just close, I know that I'm within that 100-yard range, but I don't know where they want to be and which way they want to go. Well, then sometimes I will start tree calling early so that that bird, all the birds in that roost, whether it's just a couple gobblers or whether we're talking a whole flock, knows that there's a hen or two over on that or we're in that general area and I usually will ramp up my calling sooner in an effort to convince them, you guys need to come my, I don't care where you guys normally want to go, you really ought to come my way now. So I, I will kind of judge my calling effort based on how confident I am in where those birds want to be. Make sense? Yeah. I will say this, that if I have roosted the turkey the night before and it's a lone gobbler all by himself and I didn't hear any other turkeys with him and let's say I've got him maybe isolated on a flat or somewhere where you know I can see him up in the tree and I know he's alone and let's say that I'm on public ground and I really want to kill the bird maybe 
Um, you know, maybe I have limited time to hunt and I've got a single bird in a tree, which, which, you know, in my mind, if you're trying to fill the freezer, that is the, in my mind, the best scenario. Oh, yeah. If I know that he's a single bird in the tree, there's two things. Well, there's several things. One is I'm hoping that he doesn't gobble a whole lot to attract attention. Number two is I'm going to try and watch with my binoculars as long as I'm not in so close that he can pick up literally if I, you know, grab my binos out of my bino case and just and go up with them. I'm always got my back behind a tree so that it's, you know, br breaking up my outline. But if I can watch the bird up there and kind of watch his behavior, what I like to do is I like to let him gobble and not call to him at all. And it's a real fine line, but I like to let him gobble and do his whole thing and get almost where he's going to fly down. Now, I could be different than a lot of people, but it's a fine line. And if I can get right before he's about to fly down and I call to that bird and he instant gobbles back, I call again, he answers back, then I'll just shut up. And nine times, I'd say nine and a half times out of ten, if I can call to him two good times right before he's going to fly down, he's going to fly right over to me. Now, other guys might know that he's the only turkey in the tree. And they know that if they start on him early, that he's probably going to gobble his brains out and they're going to have an unbelievable time back and forth with this turkey and he's still going to fly down and come directly over to you. I think public land hunters want to, in my opinion, call as little as possible to birds on a limb. And I have found that the kind of, in my opinion, the you play harder to get and, and and don't play your cards early that if but I've also had them up on the limb where I haven't called and then all of a sudden they pitch down early and I'm like, oh crap. Yes. He just flew out of the tree and I didn't ever call to him. And I've had situations where they fly out and then I start calling and they come or they don't come. But have you had those lone situations where you wait and wait and wait and wait, or do you typically always start in with them and just have a ball with them the whole time? Um, actually, I would say it's it's kind of a mix of that. I always, because of that last scenario that you just outlined, where they pitch out early, sometimes that'll happen, and especially with some of these mountain birds. Now, I've had it happen with Easterns in upstate New York, and I've literally, the one of the the first birds, I vivid memory of killing my, my biggest, one of my first big times, was that bird pitched out in upstate New York, dairy country, Finger Lakes region. We had vegetation called may apples or, or you know, trilliums. It's a flower that grows a certain way, and it, it creates a blanket across the forest floor. And, and the beautiful thing about it is it sits about 12 to, to 18 inches high off the ground, and then it leaps out. So you literally, half of your body is hidden underneath these flowers and stuff. It's awesome. Well, it was so early, it was so dark, that literally the only thing that I could see coming through the, the timber was a bright white head. Literally, I, I could barely see his body. All I saw was this ghostly white head snaking through, coming towards me. He was all, you know, strut, you know strutted out and fanned out. But he flew down ridiculously early. And I've seen that happen a couple times in the mountains, too, because, again, like we talked about in a previous episode, you know, the, the fact that they like to pitch out on those, the, the spots that light up earliest in the morning. Now, we could say, okay, that's the east side of the fate, or east-facing slope or whatever, but regardless, they're going to pitch out to those, open, those areas where they're open and that light up first because they want to be able to pitch out into a safe area because of mountain lions, bobcats, coyotes, and everything else. And so I have, there's been times where those birds have literally pitched out and they have pitched out early. And again, going back to what I just said a minute ago, if I don't know where I am in proximity to where the birds want to be or want to go or want to fly out, I always want him to know right where I am and give him that idea to where if that bird says, oh, I want to pitch out and he's not already committed on where he wants to be, maybe if I've got myself set up in a good spot, he'll want to pitch out and he'll want to come my way, whether that's early or late. 
Um, so I, I usually do start off early and be one of the first quote unquote hens to start tree yelping. Now, as soon as, and, and I, this, I will always, I'll, if whether, you know, if he gets up there, gobbles, boom, okay. If I haven't heard anything for a while or I haven't heard any hens, whatever, I'll just scratch out just early, you know, very early. I'll just scratch out a couple just soft little tree yelps, maybe a couple little clucks or purrs or whatever. And I will do it so soft to start that he might not even hear me. And then I will just slowly build that volume until I know he gobbled at me. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Yelp, 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 go, 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 So he, I, I mean, he just cuts me out. Boom. That tells me he heard me. He's like, huh, you're over there. I heard you. Boom, here I am. Okay. Now, from that point on, again, how much I call after that is going to be dependent on how confident of my setup I, I'm in. But if I'm close, I will agree with what you're talking about is if I know I'm where they want to be and I know that I'm close, or quite honestly, let me just put, let me just spin it around. If I know I'm close, but I may not be where they want to be, calling too much too early can sometimes cause that bird to sit up on that roost yep. and gobble his fool brains out. Waiting for you. Yes, because that's the whole point behind him gobbling. He's trying to call hens to him. And if he knows the flyout spot should be down below him, and I'm off to the side, and I start calling, and I'm making it sound like I am on the ground, then there's no reason in the world why me, as I, if I was a real hen, I wouldn't make my way over and mill around in that spot. So he's going to gobble his brains out, wait for me, and the longer I sit up there in that thicket, or that thick little spot, or over on that ridge that doesn't make any sense, again, I didn't have, the you know, coming in the morning or whatever, for some reason, I didn't know exactly where I needed to be, and I just did the best I could. Well, that may not be where the birds really want to be, and so he's going to gobble and be like, come on, baby, come down, I want to see you. Or, like you said, with public land birds, I and mean, we're talking about educated birds, one of my best public land birds took me three years to kill him because that sucker was so smart he would not go to the hen. He would gobble his brains out, and if you got close, he would run to a designated strutting area. He would physically not move an inch towards you. He would only gobble, and no matter where he was on the landscape, if you started to get close, he would leave wherever he was and go to a certain spot on the map and go up there and strut and wait, and he would wait for you to show up. And if you didn't show up within about 10, 15 minutes, he'd go dead silent and leave, just flat, walk away, and you aren't going to get on again until the next day. I mean, this bird was, he was epic. He was awesome. I finally killed him, but because I figured out what he was doing. Okay, so there are some birds that, I mean, especially those older toms, they know the whole point, biologically, the hen is supposed to go to the gobbler. So some of them will sit there and go, no, I'm gobbling, I'm strutting, you need to come to me. Whether that's on the roost or not, if he's on the roost strutting and, and carrying on, if there's a hen on the ground, it's not inconceivable for him to believe that that hen should make her way over to him, and at some point, he should be able to see her milling around down below, and then he'll pitch out for her. So, And, and, and I think, too, if they know that you know they've heard you, and you don't make your way over to him, some people think that he's going to think, well... I'm jealous. I'm going to go see yeah. what she's doing. Not necessarily. I've found it where they are aware and they become wary because they're like, why didn't yes. she come? Yes. Did a, is there a coyote down there? Yes. What is down there that made her, which naturally she should do, but now she's not? Yes. In my mind, that's why lone bird situations, I try and call later, you know, as, as late as I can, but I have had them leave the limb yeah. early and then you're, uh, you know, and, and that's and that's where I, I love what you said. And I agree with that is if you know, especially if you know you're in the direction that they want to be already. And especially if you know you're close, you don't necessarily have to call that much. And you don't have to call that early because they already want to be there. At this point, what you want to do is just kind of wait until it starts getting light enough to where you say, OK, I can see pretty well. And and. 
they should be getting ready. They should be somebody should be thinking about flying out here pretty quick. Okay, then I'm going to start to call because now it makes sense that you would be there. It's time to fly out. Now you don't have as much of an incentive for that gobbler to stay on the roost and, and gobble. He, he can see it's fly out time. I'm just going to pitch out. She's already down there. I don't need her to wait to kind of gather underneath me. She's where they naturally are going to be anyway. She's going to, she is already where we want to be. I'm just going to pitch out, join her, and get the rest of the group to come join us. Right. Right. Um, one thing I want to talk about, too, is, you know, we're going to talk about multiple birds. And, you know, if, if you hear hens in that same situation, but I want to back up just a little bit. So what are you looking for when you go to put your back up against a tree in your early morning roost setup? I know what I'm looking for. I'm curious to hear the tree or whatever you're set up in front of. What determines that? For me, it's, for me, well, go ahead. What would I? It, it's another. That question alone is an hour long <laughs> topic. <laughs> well, let me just let's settle in here. Um, no, for me, I think. And I, I guess I, I'm pretty consistent, uh, and I'm, you just made me think about this, which makes me happy that I'm consistent. Uh, it's very much similar to what I talk about with the elk stuff and the elk module, uh, the doorway principle. I kind of really dictate where my setup is and what tree I choose, or it might even be just a clump of rocks, or it might be a, a thick blow, you know, a tree top that blew down or something, but, um, most of the time, I'm, I am focused on my setup based on, now, and I'm going to assume, but I don't have to assume. It doesn't matter. If I set my decoys out, I'm going to put my decoys out where, you know, the bird, when they pitch out, if they can't see them in the tree just from the sitting in the tree, I'm going to do it most of the time. I'll, I'll do it to where when they pitch out, then they can see the decoys. Um, if I have decoys, I'm going to pick that spot. If I don't have decoys, most of the time I'm going to try to pick, find a spot where it's likely that either A, they're going to pitch out, or B, it's a likely corridor that they're going to follow and they're going to move down. And then from there, okay, where is the first place that that bird is likely going to be able to see me? Now, in the pitch black, sometimes that's a crapshoot. You're just, you're just stabbing at it in the dark. Um, but if I can, if I know that there's maybe, uh, if, Okay, let's just pick a random scenario. The birds are roosted on a little finger ridge off of the main ridge. I know that they're going to typically, typically, they might pitch out to the uphill side as close to their roost as possible. And I can get set up in that kind of orientation. Then a lot of times I'm just going to pick the biggest tree or maybe where you have a double tree, you know, two trees growing out of the same spot, you know, like a fork deal or it, something that's going to give me the best cover uh, to cover any approach that those birds take, whether it's, you know, in front of me, left, right, uphill, downhill, whatever. I'm going to try to just cover my approach. But most of the time I am focusing primarily on where are the birds going to come from, how are they going to move into my setup, and then I'm going to pick the tree the get a tree or rocks or whatever structure that gives me the best ability to capitalize on that approach as possible. I'm going to really rely on my camouflage to try to do the best I can, but I do admit that I will try to find the biggest tree or the biggest clump of trees I can just to kind of help hide me a little bit better. Yeah, and I, I'm with you as well. Sometimes, sometimes you can't find that perfect ponderosa that, say, wider than you know if you were to give it a bear hug that yep. you know i like to find the ones that you could you you can't wrap your arms around that's usually a pretty good judge but sometimes you don't have the option sometimes you have you know n not many trees or you've got you know juniper trees or you've got you know down timber you basically have to pick an area that you can get with something behind you to break out break up your outline mm -hmm. okay so that when it gets light and they look in your direction, they're not seeing you. Um, or 
you have to be with brush behind you that's kind of dense or thick and then sometimes you can sit right out in the open but you have to be pretty still with thick cover behind you yeah um and i loved downed logs right where the tree yes. snaps like if it's if it's you know snaps about three foot off and, and the big ponderosa tree let's say is leaning left on the ground and there's like a big snag you can usually sit uh, anywhere along that log, if there's like arms coming up and stuff, yes. anything that will break up. And I've even sat behind a down yep. log uh, because what that allows me to do is to have my calls and everything out in front of me, have my gun up on the log. Now, you have to be very, very careful that they don't pick you out. But if there's a downed log that has lots of vertical limbs going up and it's, you know, a snaggly looking tree, that can be a great uh, place to to set up. Yeah, and, um, and I, in the big part for me, what you've said there is some something of structure that helps break up your larger body um, outline body characteristics. Yeah. Because even though our our modern camouflage can be can be extremely uh, good. The problem is, is, is some of these habitats I've hunted in, I mean, you do. You, the ponderosa pines that they're roosted in might be 12 inches in diameter or smaller. I mean, so they're smaller pines. They might be tall, but they're just a smaller diameter tree, or they're just might, you know, where they want to pitch out. Any tree that you're, that you're going to set up nearby is a smaller diameter tree. The problem is, for those that are hunting, you know, coming from the east going west, or the, even those of us that, you know, that live in the west and, and are hunting here, we got to remember, western turkeys deal with larger predators. We've got mountain lions, you've got, I mean, number one, mountain lions and, and bears. I mean, a turkey's not going to pitch out and land next to it, typically speaking, land next to a bear. It's not that a bear's going to be able to run down a turkey, but it's just not going to land next to a predator. Mountain lions... Oh, mountain lions are, are hellacious on turkeys. They kill turkeys left and right. And so if you think about our body, if we're sitting against a small tree, and, and even though we're camouflaged, we have this bulky, blobby thing sitting there. I've had turkeys negatively react to that and just, I mean, literally pick me out instantly because, wait a minute, that wasn't there yesterday. There, there's a blob there. That wasn't there yesterday. They don't know what I am, but they know that that shape wasn't there yesterday. I'm not going over that direction. So if you can find, and I, I agree with you, I love where those big old honking pines have fallen down and you got the big punch, big limbs kind of stick it up. You can nestle right into them things and, and they'll never see you. They'll never see you. Yeah, for sure. Um, I want to talk about where it let's say that a bird is at your 12 o'clock straight in front of you and let's say he's 100 yards out if i'm a right-handed shooter and i've got myself with my back up against a ponderosa pine and i'm facing the bird i want to talk about i'm a right-handed shooter i want to turn my knees and turn Everything so that if the bird's straight out in front of me at 12 o'clock, I'm a right-handed shooter. I want to actually aim my gun barrel about 45 degrees to the right of the bird. The reason that I want to do that is so that if the bird comes out of the limb and he heads to my right, so the direction that my gun barrel is pointed, but he goes to skirt me on the right, I have the ability to shoot out at that 45 and be able to shift my shoulders about probably another 10 degrees. If my gun barrel is pointed directly at the turkey at 12 o'clock and he swings to my right, I only have about that 12 degree shift in my body being a right-handed shooter. So I always, and this, this also applies to later morning setups, Anytime a bird's coming in as a right-handed shooter, I want to have my gun barrel pointed at a 45. So if the bird is at 3 o'clock, I want to almost have my barrel pointed over at, you know, 4 or 5 o'clock so that if he does try and skirt to my right, I do have a little bit of wiggle room. And then conversely, 
with that gun barrel, let's go back to the 12 o'clock position straight out in front of me. If I'm aimed over here at 3 o'clock, if he swings anywhere on the left as a right-handed shooter, I can swing all the way back across my body and almost behind me, and I've just widened my quote-unquote range of fire. And I think that's something that people... They get, they get themselves all twisted up because if a bird's gobbling out in front of you, they aim the gun barrel at where that position is. I think it's okay to aim your barrel at the bird, but I think you need to have your shoulders and your, your body and your legs positioned kind of at the 45. And it, it's okay as the bird's gobbling or whatever to kind of have your barrel always pointed in the direction you hear the gobble but you want your body positioned as a right-handed shooter, 45 to the left, and as a left-handed shooter, you would want to be aimed and have your body angled 45 to the left. Does that make sense? It absolutely makes sense, and it's one of the things I think, <clears throat> two things. One, every single year with a new hunter, I'm always teaching because I think you're right. Uh, instinctually, instinctively, instinctually, instinctually, Instinct. Um, you naturally want, you know, people sit up and say, you know, again, birds at 12 o'clock, right straight in front of you. They sit down and they face that bird. I always tell people exactly what you just said, 10 o'clock or 2 o'clock, right-handed versus left-handed. Again, point your barrel there. That's fine, but have your body positioned so you can swing and move easier. And I think, quite honestly, for new hunters, that if you've ever set up, you've started calling birds, the birds have responded, they've started to come in, and then all of a sudden they get spooked, their heads go up, and they kind of get moved, they, they, they walk away. I will bet that if you sit back and really look at it, nine times out of ten, it very well may have been simply because of how you were positioned. Because even if, even let's say, again, let's use that scenario, 12 o'clock, it's straight in front of you, and I sit down with my back against a tree, and my gun or my knees are pointed or my legs are pointed toward that in front of me towards that bird. I'm sorry. Even if that bird makes a straight line from him to me and I'm a right hand shooter, you think about it trying to point your gun straight down your legs, you know, in that direction, you still are you're contorted. You're you're not natural and you have you're going to have to if that bird comes in and you want to put a beat on him, your natural shoulders and chest are going to move. And I think that little bit of movement is what sets them off, and then they hang up, they stay out there, and then they skirt you, and then, oh, there we go, it didn't work. Whereas, if you do what Jay said, and what I talk about all the time, is just set it up to where your knees are off at an angle. And Like I said, I, I talk about 10 and 2. So if you're a right-handed shooter, I want the bird at my 10 o'clock. I'm I'm facing my if I if the direction I'm facing is twelve o'clock, I want that bird at ten o'clock. I can put my barrel on that bird at ten o'clock very, very comfortably without moving my shoulders. And if I you know, Jay, you nailed it. If he swings to my right, I can swing easily. If he swings to my left, he can go all the way around me and I can swing on him without hardly having to move or contort myself very, very much. So no, I think it's one of the most important new hunters. Well, Hunters in general, I think it's one of the most important things to consider when setting up. Now, for those people that are listening that bow hunt and want to bow hunt, and I don't care if you're bow hunting and if you're in your blind or if you're bow hunting just with your butt sitting against a tree, this time, at that point, I say you want to set up with that bird at your 9 o'clock. So even further. You, you, want it, you want that bird, you want your shoulders the line of your shoulder from left shoulder to right shoulder or right shoulder to left shoulder, the line of your shoulders pointing in the direction of that bird. Because if I'm a right-handed bow sh archery shooter, which I am, I extend my bow arm out. If we're at the range, our natural alignment, our, our chest is going to be essentially parallel, you know, or our, our, I guess it depends on what you, perpendicular. Our chest is going to be pointing towards, or, or the, the flat part, what am I trying to say? The flat part of our chest. We're, we're, we're turned at an angle to the, to the target. We're not facing the target. Make sense? Same thing with birds. If the turkey comes in, all I want to have to do is just pull that bow back and not have to move. But if he swings to my right 
in front of me, I can move and I can swing. If he swings to my left, I can move and I can swing. But if I point my body at that bird, there's no way I'm going to draw that bow back and be able to shoot down my legs without having to majorly contort my body. And then I'm going to get myself out of position of, you know, I'm not going to be in good shooting form. I'm not going to have a good sight picture. I guarantee you're going to miss that bird or just wound it and, and not going to make a good shot. So if it's shotgun, 10 or 2. If it's a bow hunter, 9 or 3, depending on which side you're on. Good stuff. Um, let's go back to the scenario of we've talked about the single bird uh, gobbler in a tree. Let's talk about um, you're going in and you're – you know that you have a gobbler and hens in the tree. You're in there in the morning. You're close. The first thing that starts up is hen talk, you know, tree, tree calling. In my opinion, you have to join in and be part of the flock right away. If you wait too late, you will be somewhat kind of like the outcast. And I've seen them just gather up and fly the other way. In my mind, when you hear other hens where a lot of guys are like, man, I don't sound as good as that hen, and it makes them reluctant, I think you have to be the opposite. I think you have to get in there and agitate those hens. I think you have to mimic the hen and maybe pick one specific hen out and just, you know, mimic her and, you know, quite a bit more calling when you're hearing hens. Uh, the, the, the just call a couple times and, and sit back and see what happens, it never works. I, I shouldn't say never. Very rarely works. You have to be the aggressor. Curious your thoughts. I will agree with that. For I will agree with that with this one caveat. Unless you know that your butt, is, or, your butt or your decoys are literally sitting in the spot where they naturally want to fly out. Correct. If you know that you're already, and you don't even have, in this situation, sometimes you don't even need, if you know where they fly out and you've watched and they fly out every time the same spot, sometimes you don't even need a decoy. Just sit your butt down there and just sluice them. Let them fly out. Let them do their natural thing. And when that Tom hits the ground and he's in range, smoke him. So if those, if that's the case, I won't say a word. You don't have to. Just let them believe that there's nothing different from this morning versus all the other mornings that they've done, whatever they've done, every other morning previous. Okay, So that's the only time I will say no. However, if I know that, if, if I don't know where the birds want to be, and I'm not confident at the directions they're going to fly out, and or I know they just can't see my decoys or whatever, then absolutely, I agree. Most cases, you're better off engaging that dominant, you'll hear those hands start going. You really need to start engaging. And, and some people talk about challenging. Some people talk about threatening, whatever. You, you need to sound like a hen who's in, in control. Here's the tidbit I will say. If you're going to do that, in my experience, and, and on, the, on the turkey module, I talk about... Um, two different styles of hen yelps. And if you listen, and I've got some video footage on there where you can hear the different vocalizations, the two different hen yelp vocalizations, all right? Hens will yelp, but they can do a yelp in one of two different ways. One high-pitched, fat, high, higher-pitched, fast-paced yelping. Okay? Or you will hear those lower pitch oftentimes very raspy and what I call low and slow. Oh, 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 oh. You know, just just real raspy and just slower cadence. Oftentimes, those dominant older hens that are dominant and in controlling the groups are the ones doing that low and slow. Oh, 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 oh. Just real raspy. Even though the high-pitched, fast-paced yelps will get those gobblers fired up and gobbling. It's not necessarily the hens that they are listening to and following the orders of. Same thing with the rest of the hens. You'll hear hens up there just going off. 
but it's the ones that are oftentimes doing that low and slow that are actually dictating where that flock goes. So if I know that I have to challenge some hens or I need to engage those hens and I get to try to convince them to come my way, I am going to choose a mouth call or I'm going to use my box call. I'm going to use a call that is raspy and I'm going to use that kind of low and slow cadence and I'm going to try to sound like a boss hen, an older age class hen that is trying to take charge of that group. A lot of times, that's when you'll hear the actual boss hen, she'll kick in. She will absolutely kick in and just stomp your butt. She has, you know, cutting and just, ow, 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 just, just going nuts trying to say, no, who the heck are you? You're not the one in charge. If she does that, just keep stepping it up. Just, just pour the coals to it. Just crank that fire. Because you get her ticked off, she pitches out and comes over to see what the heck is going on and who you are, the entire flock is coming your way. So, even though you're excited, if, if you naturally tend in, your natural tendency is to be that excited, high pitched, fast paced calling, yes, it might get him gobbling, it might get him fired up, and yes, if he pitches out first, or pitches out earlier than everybody else, or see you've got a dominant bird, and then a couple subordinate toms in, in that mix, yes, that can pull one of those subordinate toms over. Yes, it can work. I'll tell you, my better success has been that low and slow, very, very raspy, and just try to get the whole group to come. Chris, I want to play a little um, clip here for you. I'm going to see if it works and have you listen to this.
perfect high pitch, fast pace yelping. And then you heard right at the end where she just flew down and came right, I mean, she flew right to me. Normally, I'm not that, um, you know, I'm not normally that in your face with the hens, but she was real mouthy. She was the only one that I could see, and he was with her, and I knew that I had to get all over her. So with my box call, I just stayed after her, and that, that hen flew uh, right down and flew right to me, in which he then flew right off uh, and flew right to her, and she was already right in front of my face, and, and my hunter was able to shoot her. But I think that gives a good example of, you know, being mouthy back and kind of mimicking, yeah. you, you know, exactly what she was saying yeah and and there's a there's a lot to be said about just you know if you don't know what you're saying if you if you're not sure what vocalizations to make do what they do basically because what you're what you're essentially doing at that point is is if she gets excited you're getting excited if she gets more excited you're even more excited and so it's basically this this standoff you know this this yeah i mean you're basically the point where someone has to give and if you if you're not one of two things is going to happen She's either going to come over and take a look and see what the heck's going on, or she goes, "All right, I've given you enough of a chance. We're going this way," and they just turn and they just go off and they and they they go their own separate way. The beautiful thing, and this is, and I and I, the, I'm glad you played that because the beautiful thing about that is, even if my setup in the morning doesn't work and they go a different direction, especially if we're talking about you know most mountain states. Western states, you're talking about starting your season middle of sept- or excuse me, no, middle of April, not September. Middle of April. In some places, you're kind of catching that you're, you're catching the behavioral cycle where the birds are kind of starting to get already flocked up or are hen up, and literally by the end of April, beginning of May, some of those hens are starting to to go off and nest. And so, even though that bird may be with hens in the morning does not necessarily mean he's going to be with the hens later in the morning or even in the afternoon. A lot of times, if those birds hear hens that were near the roost at first light, but those hens never you know, showed up and, and kind of got married up with their flock and moved off with them, those times will circle right back around and kind of try, once they're on their own, they'll circle back around and try to pick those guys, try to find those hens again and try to pick them up. So yeah, no, I if 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 you're dealing with a gobbler with hens, a lot of times you're you're stuck with engaging those hens and trying to get the hens to come to you or get the flock to come to you. But don't be discouraged if they don't, because those gobblers will sometimes come back and swing back around and check it out. And that's one question I would ask you. You've got a morning setup, you've got good interaction with birds, they fly down. They don't necessarily come to you. They may skirt you. They gobble. They're not spooked. They just didn't come to you. You heard some other distant birds gobbling. You had, you know, let's say a couple different gobblers in your setup and, and, you know, 10, 12, 15 hens. And other birds heard you and were gobbling in the distance to you calling how long do you sit right there and wait and continue to call or how long does it take you to move either on one of those other birds that you hear gobbling or the main flock that didn't come your way? Oh, I I think there's a couple things in there that go into my decision-making process. Number one, am I just running and gunning if if I'm with a shock? Well, do I have a blind or not? It, a lot of times, if I'm going to be hunting a blind, like we had talked about in the earlier episode about that one New Mexico turkey hunt that I did, you know, I, we were my wife and I were sitting in a blind, and so I hiked that blind in, set it up, and I knew I was in a good spot. And so even though the first bird came in and I missed, um, there were other gobblers around, and I knew I was in a good movement corridor, and so we just sat there and waited, and we were just kind of dinking around, and sure enough, another bird came in and whacked. So if I know that I'm kind of stationary with a blind or whatever, I'll sit and I will just let the setup work and I will let their natural behavior across that landscape just come to play. However, or or even if I'm not in a blind, if I know, okay, 
the fly, you know, the gobbler that's in the tree this morning didn't respond to me, but I know there's other birds nearby, and where I'm set on this ridge makes sense that other turkeys are going to be wandering up and down the ridge or back and forth up and down the, the, the ridge or whatever. Shoot, I might just sit there and wait and not get up too soon because a lot of times I... <laughs> I've spooked birds by getting up too soon. That's the problem. You know, you want to get up and run and gun and chase after them, and all of a sudden you stand up and boom, there's there were some birds working down the ridge line. So I will let it literally sit and wait if there's been other birds nearby that I know of. I might sit there for several hours. However, if in some of these places we hunt, you know, you might have one gobbler here and literally the only other group of turkeys you know of are, you know, a quarter mile, half mile, or you know, half mile away. These birds flew down. They went the other way. There's no other birds around me that I know of. All right, I'm going to pick up. I'm going to move. I'm going to go, and I'm going to try to close the distance on that other group and then set up and try them. So it depends on how much movement I really think there's going to be in the area. Yeah, I think that's a good answer. I think, you know, I've done both too where I stand up too early and that flock that I was originally working, they've only moved off 50 yards. They have, I can't hear them. They're quiet. I thought they're gone, but literally they're just over there strutting and, you know, being turkeys and I stand up and spook the whole flock. And I think it's hard to um, know what the right thing to do is, but I would always say give it maybe a little more time than you thought and then maybe come back and maybe that's a good spot for you to be sitting that afternoon uh, and, and, and try and have your decoys and such and be ready for maybe those birds to cross back by and hopefully roost in that same area. Yeah, and um, the, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. That before we, the one thing that, the other thing to keep in mind is you've said it already a couple times, um, even in previous episodes, but Take it, pay attention to how many hens he's got. If he's got like 8 to 10, 12 hens, he's got a pile of hens. He's going to be busy. And most likely he's going to, it doesn't matter if we're talking early or even toward later on the season, he's got a bunch of hens. He's probably going to be stuck with those hens all day, especially early season. I mean, he's going to be with those hens. But if he's... If you're listening and literally they fly out or you're scouting or whatever or you see tracks in the snow or whatever and you go, man, he's it's one gobbler with two hens. Man, it won't it, – he may not be with those both those hens for very long. He might go through them first thing in the morning and literally – yeah, he flew down. He went with them. But literally in the next 30 to 45 minutes, he's done breeding them. He might mill around with them a little bit, but – if they just move off a short distance and are ignoring him, he might literally swing right back around and come in by himself or come in silent within an hour of daybreak. So a lot of times... And, and or those other birds that you heard yeah. in the distance, a lot of times they will work their way just because they want to... There's they're a subordinate bird that's, you know, a single, and they're, they may not come in gobbling. They may come in silent, but good chance that if you just stayed put... Yes and called every once in a while that they would come in silent and the next thing you know right out in your vision out out in your decoy spread you'd have a gobbler slinking his way in coming to check things out yep and there's a lot of times where me and my you know if it was a buddy of mine or whatever we uh, i joke all the time a buddy of mine keith it was just a you know we worked these birds in the morning they didn't work they didn't, it didn't happen okay we kind of got up and moved a little bit but we were like you know what we don't know where the heck we need to be and it's too thick in some of these areas for us to know what the heck's going on. We know the birds are using this area. We're just going to go back and let's just sit and just wait and see. Sure enough, you know, my buddy Keith is sitting there eating peanut butter you know, out of an MRE. He's eating the peanut butter and crackers, and he's got a mouthful of crackers just crunching away. And all of a sudden, this gobbler cuts loose like 80 yards away from us. He's got no clue. All he can hear in his ears is just crunching crackers and peanut butter. I'm yelling at him to get it set up. But, yeah, I mean... These birds, give it some time. Have some patience. Remember, they don't have a work schedule. They don't have soccer practice. They don't have to, you know, you, you, they don't have birthday parties. They got They're there all day. They have no place to be, so they, they're not in a hurry. So, 
if you're going to be out there and hunt, if you know you're in a good spot, you know they heard you off the roost, they just went out and they walked off, especially if you know that bird only has a couple hens or if you know other birds in the area, man, just sit your butt tight. And, man, there's sometimes I'll just sit there until 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning, not moving, just waiting. Because they're, they, a lot of times they'll come sneaking in and, and just taking their time with, you know, once they got done with the hens that they were after, they filled their crop, they kind of filled their stomach a little bit, now they're off on explore mode, and they're going to go right to where they heard those birds in the morning. Absolutely. Let's talk a little bit about early morning roost situation decoy setups. I, I think it's a good time to bring decoys in, t- specifically talking about early morning roost setups. And... I think you made a good point earlier with the decoys. I am going to try and set the decoys. If I have my choice, I want the decoys to be able to be seen from the tree. So if I'm hunting on public ground, I typically don't like to use a full strutting decoy turkey just from a safety perspective. Uh, I do hunt a lot of private ground as well. Uh, On private ground, I am going to advocate using a full strutting decoy and I'm basically going to set up the jake, I'm going to set up some hens, and I'm going to set up, you know, I, I tend to take the whole flotilla out there and take the whole flock with me. Um, and I want to set that turkey full strutting fan, I want the fan facing right at the gobbler, and I want the gobbler's, the decoy's head facing kind of in my direction. And Say, that, okay, I, back up. Say that again. I want the fan facing the turkey. Okay, the back so of the butt, okay, right. the butt. The butt of the fan, okay. the, his butt facing. I want the decoy butt facing the turkey in the tree or where I think the turkey can see. And I want the head of the decoy facing in my direction. You know, maybe not right at me, but in my direction. And But I definitely think a key to decoys in the morning is either, like you said, where they can see it from the tree or they can see it from when they hit the ground, they look over and see the decoys. Yes. Thoughts? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, yep, yep, yep. If I it, Now, if I think I've got some really, really call shy birds or, or really kind of, again, if you know that the flock of birds that you're hunting is a very isolated group and they're the only birds in that region, that they're only birds in that area, Typically speaking, I will put, I will not have those decoys out where they can see them when they pitch out. I will try to set them off to the side to where when the birds pitch out, they hit the ground, then they can see the birds there. I don't want to, I don't want them sitting there stewing on it going, wait a minute, who, where, how? Sometimes I've, I've been in situations where the birds see a decoy or they hear me calling and they, and they know that there are no other turkeys around. They get all weirded out and spooked and they just kind of move off however there's other times where yeah if i if i know that i can get those decoys out there in the open where they're going to pitch out and i'm not going to bust them i'm going to set those babies exactly like what you just talked about my priority again i think you made a good distinguishing um caveat to that is public versus private if you know you're in a situation where you are the only person that are, that's going to be in there or your, your hunting party is the only people that are going to be in there, okay, then you have a little bit more flexibility. I also, I've always been a firm believer. There's, there's many schools of thoughts, and, but the two main schools are, you know, put the head of the decoy facing the turkey because, you know, the turkey wants to come in and fight the decoy. Or, like what Jay just said, and I, I agree with you, and this is after a lot of testing, I will always have that decoy's tail fan generally facing the, his butt, his rear end, facing towards the decoy. And a lot of times in my setup, I'll actually set it at a, You mean towards the bird? Towards the bird. I'll have it set up as an angle to where the, bird, the, the, the actual live turkey, when he's looking at the decoy, sees mostly the butt of the fan, the back part of the fan, maybe a little bit of the side of the body, and maybe catch a little bit of his bright, you know, bright red, white, and blue head. But I want the butt of his fan, or the butt of the, the decoy fan, facing more towards the bird. Because even if, 
you have a very, very aggressive Tom, and he wants to come in and just bowl that thing over. 99.9% of the time, he's going to sneak in from behind the fan and, and of the decoy and kick it over. If you have a very timid, timid Tom that is more of a lover than a fighter and wants to engage that decoy, but he's a little cautious, he's going to come in from behind that fan. So if you set your decoy up to allow them to do that, it doesn't matter what behavioral uh, disposition that turkey that you're calling has, you've set it up to where that he, he feels comfortable engaging that decoy. Now, if you're on public or if you're on public ground, however, and you are set up to where another hunter could come into your position from any certain direction without maybe you seeing them, then in my opinion, safety trumps strategy on your decoy setup. With if you're using a full strutter, and I will say, point your decoy head straight at you, okay? Because if a hunter comes into your setup from anywhere out in front, anywhere from the sides of you, out in front of you, if they come into your setup from in front of you, the only sight picture that they will have is of the turkey's butt, your decoy butt in the fan, okay? So they don't have a good, clear headshot, which means hopefully they're not taking body shots. Hopefully they're not going to shoot in your direction. If they come in to your left or right, they can see the head, and if they, do, if they choose to take a shot at your decoy, hopefully, it's not a great situation, but hopefully all that shot will pass harmlessly in front of you by you. Whereas, if they come in from behind you and they have a full-on frontal shot of that dirty decoy, if you have been able to set yourself up to where you have some sort of structure behind you, a big tree behind you, rocks or whatever, hopefully if they do take a shot, you're safe. But using a, a, a full strut decoy on public ground when you, ha when you know you have a lot of other public land hunters out there can be... It, you just got to be very, very um, care okay. yeah, careful with it. And that's why I said just put the decoy so it faces you so it really limits the only time that you can get yourself in trouble is if someone's taking body shots or someone sneaks in behind you that you're unaware of. Yeah, I think it, that's exactly the safest way to handle that. And I will say that one of the reasons why I have the decoys always facing in my direction, too, is that it tells the other turkey, the live turkeys, that that if if I was that that they're facing my direction and that they're so the decoys are, are, look like real birds, and if there was any alarm or any problems in my direction where I'm sitting, these turkeys would already know it. So it gives the bird that's coming, say, from 12 o'clock, the ability to know that these birds are already facing me. The decoys are facing me. So there's no problem in my direction, which then allows usually the bird to come in with more confidence that there is no problem out in front of these turkeys. Whereas behind these turkeys, that bird doesn't know as much, but he's... He, I guess, does it make sense that I want those decoys facing me so that towards my direction is no problem, which makes them come even closer to me, the guy with the shotgun? I, I can generally agree with that, but I, you know, as your friend, I will play devil's advocate. I like it. If the turkeys were actually relaxed and they thought that it, the entire situation was safe, they'd be scattered feeding all sorts of different directions. They'd be relaxed to feed... Left of you, right of you, front of you, back of you, away from you. You know what I mean? And you, no, and, I, that's a good point. And you'll see turkeys, I mean, you'll see the gobblers out there. When they're relaxed, they're kind of in the middle of the show or they're off to the side and they're, they're turning 360 degrees. They're just, they're, they're all over the place. And same thing with the hens. They're picking, moving here, picking you, moving here. So, I mean, I agree with you. I, I don't have a problem with what, you know, me and you, if you and I were setting up like that, I wouldn't, 
I can't. I, uh, my wife will disagree with this. I, I would. My OCD wouldn't kick in strongly to where I'd want to reset your tea glass. <laughs> 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 you no, know, I, I mean, I, it, it absolutely makes sense. But you know, for me, I don't. I don't worry about that. If I, for me, all things being equal, if I'm not doing on my thing on private ground, or I'm in an area where I know that I'm, the, I'm pretty much the only person in there. I, my primary, I will put that. That strutter. If I'm if I'm using a strutter decoy, I will put the strutter decoy where I want to take the shot at the appropriate at the, at the sweet spot as far as my effective range of where I want that where I want to take the shot and how far I want the shot to be, and I will position that strutter decoy to make sure that the tail is allowed allowing that gobbler to sucker in behind it if it wants to, and then I just use my hand decoys as filler. And I just usually will scatter them around, and I'll I'll point them different directions, and just kind of use it as as a, as a filler situation. So, okay, so birds at twelve o'clock, you've got your strutter in the ideal situation where you can shoot. Do you put any hens between the the, the strutting go, uh, decoy and the turkey, or are all the subsequent hens from the same distance towards you? And that's how I set it up. Like, yeah, the, the strutter will be the furthest away from me. And then I'll set a Jake off to the left, a couple hens positioned, but closer to me. Usually my strutter is the furthest thing away from me, but I don't, I like to set my decoys no further than, I don't, I, I want the decoys to be no further than 30 yards from me. Yeah, and I, 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 well, yes, I don't disagree with that at all. I just use it as, um, from, if, yes, you and I, I'm assuming you're using a 12 gauge. I'm assuming you're using kick pow shells. I'm assuming that you're using a good turkey choke. So you've got good range out to 40 plus yards, but your sweet spot is 30. Absolutely. I, you know, if you're using, if folks that are listening to this, if you're taking kids out and they're using a 20 gauge or you're using, Bring them in. yeah, if you, Bring them in. wherever the sweet spot of your pattern is, that's where I'm going to set that decoy. Okay. So that way I'm, 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 I, I want to have, if that gobbler comes in and engages that decoy, I want the, the best scenario possible. But if he hangs out another 10, 15 yards beyond it, I still want to be able to smack him as well. So, yeah, yeah, no, I, that's it for as far as the hens go. Um, generally speaking, yes, whatever direction the gobbler's coming from, most of the time I want him to engage in a, I guess, we, and I don't know if you want to talk about the whipping boy setup, but anyway, he's going to engage my gobbler or my strut or my Jake decoy first, and then the hens are beyond that. They're either lateral to that point or they're beyond that. So if the your scenario, the gobbler is at twelve o'clock, straight in front of me, then if he, if he comes in, he's going to engage a Jake decoy or a strut decoy first, and then the hens are either going to be to his left or right. Or they're going to be closer to me. If the gobbler is off to say my nine o'clock, straight to my left, my Jake decoy or, or strutter decoy is going to be right where I want to take the shot. And then I might have a hen decoy a little bit further. I might have a hen decoy closer to me, but the rest of my hen decoys will be to my right. So that way he engages the strutter or the Jake first, and then he has to move through in, in order to engage those hens. Good stuff, good stuff. Well, buddy, that's we've uh, covered a lot of ground here on early morning roost uh, setups. On our next episode, we're going to cover mid morning, midday, and late afternoon, evening setups. Uh, we'll be talking about. <laughs> no, we're not. we just got we covered like one section. You, you, yeah, I, I, we're going to end up having like an eight part series. This is awesome. <laughs> I appreciate you spending time with us. I uh, want to give you a chance to let the listeners. Uh, uh, know where they can find you, so do that, please. Yeah, absolutely. All of my stuff, you can get at, just look up Row Hunting Resources. That's R O E Hunting Resources. We've got the main website, which is a, it's an educational based website. A lot of videos on there, and there's different subscription modules. Um, but you can, and if you do want to subscribe and want to learn some more about this type of stuff, if you go in and, and get a subscription in the promo code portion. Always remember, you can type in J. Scott Podcast, and it takes 20% off of that subscription price. But we've also got our YouTube channel and Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. You can find, this, find me anywhere and just look up Row Hunting Resources 
and it'll it'll get you hooked up. Thank you, buddy, so much. I look forward to uh, right, brother. The, the next couple episodes, and I appreciate you uh, being on with us. Absolutely. No, it's always fun.